I'm here with uh, Rick Bardou, who is a lead engineer at the uh, Liquity project, which is a, a stable coin, but also a borrowing protocol project. I, I believe it falls under the category of DeFi, so decentralized finance. And that's, that's also why I, I, I named this uh, stream uh, Truly Decentralized Money. Rick, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for, to, for coming on to the uh, Money and Macro channel. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about the Liquity project that you're working so hard on and basically, yeah, what it is and also like, why do we need Liquity? What's the use of Liquity? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. It's really great to be here. Um, great to be on your show. So Liquity is, um, is a decentralized borrowing system. It's based on the Ethereum blockchain. It allows people to borrow uh, funds against their Ether collateral. So Ether is this native cryptocurrency on the Ethereum blockchain. Mm -hmm. And many people who hold Ether are bullish on it and they expect the price to appreciate over time. So obviously they want to hold on to their Ether, but maybe they would also like to be able to kind of use their funds in the meantime. So perhaps they have expenses to pay or they would actually like to make a, a big purchase, say like a house or a car. So if they can borrow funds against the Ether, that, that can benefit them. And that's what Liquity enables people to do. So they post their Ether as collateral, mm -hmm. and they then allow our system to borrow our native stablecoin, LUSD. And this stablecoin is pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the US dollar. And once they have that LUSD stablecoin, they can then do anything they like with it. They could trade it for fiat money and then buy something in the physical world, or mm -hmm. they could actually maybe use it to earn interest. Um, in the crypto ecosystem. And they, they could also actually uh, use it to increase their Ether exposure if they wanted to kind of go through a leverage cycle. So yeah, there's a few different ways they can use their funds. So the main goal is to allow people to basically monetize their Ether while keeping it. Is, is that a correct way of saying it? Or am I I'm making it too simple now? Yeah, that's the primary use case. It's really to, to gain, get liquidity or unlock liquidity against your holdings. And it's for people who have that bullish view on the ether, so they expect it to appreciate. And yeah. The loan is actually interest-free as well, so it's um, kind of unique in that sense. Yeah, so it's interest-free yeah. to put your ether in your vault, basically, uh, and then get those stable coins. So I've actually compared basically stable coins uh, in one of my earlier videos about central banking to what they used to do in the in the seventeenth century in the Netherlands, uh, for example, the Bank of Amsterdam, or you could go with actual gold, you know, deposit gold in the Bank of Amsterdam, then get some Bank of Amsterdam deposits and trade with those deposits. I think it's very similar to that. What, what do you think of that comparison? Yeah, I think there's definitely similarities. Like the, the basic mechanism is, is pretty similar. There are definitely differences with kind of blockchain technology mm -hmm. in that it's, it's fully decentralized. So well, our system is at least so that um, you can actually, you know, you interact directly with the protocol on Ethereum. So this kind of system of rules kind of encoded in, in smart contract code that lives on the blockchain, it's kind of an automatic machine in a way. And so there's no kind of middleman or um, banker deciding if you should or shouldn't be allowed to, to make this deposit and take this loan. It's all fully automated. It's fully permissionless. So actually anybody can, can make that Ether deposit and draw LUSD against it as long as they kind of... Um, meeting the conditions baked into the protocol. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really good because the thing is like I'm an economist and so I love to compare this to the th stuff that I already know. So that would be a bank. But you're definitely right to point out that that it really isn't because there is no middleman, right? Can you tell a little bit more about, you know, how that then works because I think, you know, I know there are also a lot of blockchain enthusiasts in the in the chat, who definitely will think this is a piece of cake, but but I think for the economics crowd, it's it's a bit mind blowing. Sure, yeah. So blockchain is basically a kind of um, it's a it's a tamper proof record of of actions and transactions, and it's it's tamper proof because it lives on thousands of computers around the world, and they they all hold the same record of of uh, history of the kind of like transaction history and basically it's kind of secured by the the miners you've probably heard about these miners who mine cryptocurrency that they actually are kind of paid to secure the network and like make it tamper proof but these are the ethereum miners then right yeah so that's kind of the underlying blockchain technology and then on ethereum it's possible to build applications that uh, borrow its uh, its kind of trust properties so you know, we've, we've deployed Liquity to Ethereum and the application itself is, is actually set in stone because like we've deployed the code 
And mm-hmm. that code is the same across all those machines that run the Ethereum network. And we've actually removed ourselves as, as owners of that code. So now there's actually no kind of admin or central controller of the, of the liquidity system. And so the code is immutable. It can't be changed ever. It could only kind of be changed if the Ethereum network itself is changed. So it, it has this kind of powerful property of borrowing the, the trust of the underlying network. And yeah, in, in doing so, that mean, makes it, uh, um, it means you can trust the code instead of you know, trusting the operator, basically. So that immediately makes me want to ask two questions. Uh, one is, so if, if you are not there, then I would immediately wonder, like, okay, how then do you make money? And then the second uh, would be, if it's fixed, the code is fixed, what happens if there is a bug or a feature of the system that doesn't work as you expect it? But let's maybe do the first question uh, first. Uh, like, how, how do you then make money? Because somebody is paying you, right? Right. So, so the liquidity business model is pretty unconventional. We we do have a small one-time borrowing fee on every every loan that's issued. So it's actually applied to the the debt when somebody takes a loan. So if somebody borrows, say. 2000 LUSD, the, the borrowing fee is typically a one time upfront fee of about 0.5%. So mm-hmm. they will then owe 2000 plus 10. So they'll owe, owe 2010 LUSD. And that's what they'll have to repay eventually. And those fees go to holders of the, the native system token, which is a secondary token called LQTY. And mm-hmm. Holders of this token can stake it in our system, and the fees just get immediately sent to those holders and split pro rata across all the holders. So it's a little bit like kind of analogous to uh, you know shares and dividends. So like you know having a dividend of profits split between the uh, the shareholders. Yeah. So indeed, when I was looking at sort of your 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 protocol, I was thinking as well. Okay, if I need to compare it to a bank, even though it's of course not a bank in the sense that there is no entity, you could still say that sort of the assets would be Ethereum that's locked away, right? And then you issue these coins against those, and people holding that are, are fairly similar to deposit holders, and then you have equity holders, right? And and they yeah. are the ones that uh, are crucial, I, I would guess. Because sometimes, you know, people might make a loss on their, their loans, right? And they are the buffer there, just like in a, in a normal bank. Uh, but can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on how that, work and also how that works? And also, for example, the staking, because I think staking is something that's a bit foreign for us who are not necessarily always uh, in the crypto space, uh, especially since, like, I know that staking is uh, putting your, I say I know, (laughs) I should say, I think staking is putting your crypto to work on the blockchain uh, to verify the transactions through a proof of stake mechanism. But then again, what does confuse me is a little bit like, aren't there also the miners? Did Ethereum move from proof of work to proof of stake? Or is this something that's your protocol? Like, how, how does that work? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll tackle the staking piece then. So basically, there's, there's kind of two layers of staking. There's, there's the kind of underlying blockchain network, which is the Ethereum network. And yes, they, are, they will be moving to um, a full proof of stake system soon. And that's kind of like a way of securing the network. And it's to do with yeah, network security and how the, the um, transactions are ordered. So that's very separate from what we call staking in liquidity. Mm. And staking in liquidity is much simpler. It's really just a case of there's this kind of pool where you can put your LQTY tokens, which are similar to the equity in the system. And when you put them in the pool, all, all revenues that pass through the system just kind of get split between those as members of the pool. It's really just a way to, it's actually a technical implementation for distributing the, uh, the revenues to the LQTY holders because it, it would be very expensive to like send it out individually to all the holders and you'd probably need some manual process. Whereas if they can actually just put it all in the pool, you can just easily send it to that pool and have it split up mm. automatically. So it's really kind of just a, a technical way to issue dividends, if you if you like. So, so the staking there doesn't uh, verify any transactions. That's correct. Yeah, it's it's nothing to do with like proof of stake or anything like that. Ah, okay. Yeah. It is super confusing to me that yeah. you you give it the same name then, or is that just me being non-initiated? I agree. I think. Um, it is confusing. It's just kind of like how the terminology is played out in the space. There's staking at the protocol layer and there's staking at the app layer and they're very different, yeah. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah. And then also you said, hey, we make money through, there's a small percentage every time someone issue, uh, gets into a new loan agreement on the in, in the protocol. But you also said there's no interest, but isn't there then an interest rate? Like a small, yeah, you a can, hidden one? You know, there's always a way to sort of make, the, you know, you could calculate the effective interest rate, right? But the, 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 I suppose the main point with liquidity is it's, it's a one-time upfront fee and you know exactly what you pay up front and the term of the loan is unlimited. So, you know, your, your effective interest rate will change depending on just how long you want to keep the, the loan open for. So it's better value to keep it open for longer because you've already kind of incurred the fee as, at the point you open the loan. Okay. So, and then there's also how do you keep the value? Like, because this is very different, I think, from my Bank of Amsterdam example. Because there, sort of, you have the gold in the vault, and then the Bank of Amsterdam money, you know, sort of creates liquidity for people who have gold. They can spend that money. But you do something similar with Ether. However, your uh, tokens are uh, pegged to US dollars. And this was different in this bank of Amsterdam. It's just like pegged to gold. Uh, you're not pegged to ether. Like, why is that, and how how does that work? Yeah. So the equity holders, the value of the equity, we'll, we'll call it the LQTY token because that's what it is. So it's like um, it's not really uh, the value of that is not guaranteed. That can go up and down, and mm -hmm. people can, you know, the market values that based on like expected revenues in the system. So last year we did like. 28 million dollars in revenue and then people can kind of extrapolate that back to the value of one LQTY token because there's a finite supply of those but the other side of things is this LUSD token and that that is pegged to the dollar and that's we want that to maintain a very good price stability and yeah I mean it's like the, the ether is the collateral which is mm -hmm. a volatile asset but you borrow dollars against that Um, but we, we do ensure that the whole system is, is always over collateralized so that the value of the total collateral in the system is greater than the value of the outstanding um, LUSD debt. And there's, that's enforced kind of um, at the individual level where each, each borrower has to maintain a minimum collateral ratio of 110%. So if they deposit like $11,000 worth of ETH, they, have to, they can't borrow more than 10,000 LUSD. And if they fall below that level, they're actually vulnerable to liquidation. And yeah. it's those liquidations that keep the system healthy and keep it over collateralized and keep the LUSD fully backed. Yeah, because that, that's how I, I interpret that your stablecoin differs from a lot of others, right? Like how I see it, yours, and, and maybe this will piss off some sort of crypto, you know, people who have a crypto ideology of getting off the fiat uh, based system. You, you build on the fiat system because that's what you ultimately pack to, I, I would say. But then there are a lot of um, stable coins that, that build on the fiat system uh, directly because they sort of have like a 100% reserve bank situation going on where they have a lot of fiat assets like US treasuries and then they issue stable coins against that. But you have sort of Ethereum in between and how I understand like because Ethereum fluctuates, you need people to put in more Ethereum and hence that's over collateralized to make sure you know, that the, the peg isn't broken. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's, it's because we have this volatile asset ether that can drop, you know, 10 or 20% in a day. We need it to be you know, sufficiently over collateralized to actually fully back the, the LUSD supply. Yeah. Yeah. But what happens if, because you, I think you're over collateralized 110%. Is that right? That's, that's the minimum on an individual level. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and people can choose how much they want to be over collateralized. Yeah, right. And we, we have kind of the riskier borrowers and the, the safer borrowers. And we have many people at like 200 or 300% collateral ratio. So they have like mm -hmm. collateral to their debt. And then we have, you know, the riskier ones who like to ride the, ride the boundary and stay closer to that one 10%. Yeah. Because then you sort of monetize more of your ether and you're still invested in ether and you can spend it on, on other stuff as well. Yeah. Right. But then, so, but how do I lose if I do that? Like if I borrow from you, uh, or, no, 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 sorry, from your, through your system, through your protocol, I borrow from someone else through your protocol and I over collateralize at uh, 110% because I'm, I'm, I love risk. But the price of Ether now drops by more than 10%, which actually happened, I think, right? Not too long ago, or probably for some borrowers. How does that then work? So I'll talk about just kind of a small price drop first, and then maybe like we can talk about the kind of more extreme scenarios. Mm -hmm. so like 
In liquidity, when somebody falls below that 110%, they're immediately vulnerable to liquidation. And liquidations are very quick in liquidity. So they happen within seconds or minutes of a, a trove falling below that, that level because the, the actual process is kind of automatic within the system and pretty much instant. And so the only kind of time delay is based upon like waiting for somebody to actually trigger the liquidation. And it's a publicly um, accessible function. So anybody can kind of press the liquidation button and liquidate a position in liquidity. And in doing so, they actually get compensated for that because there's, there are transaction costs on Ethereum. Anytime you take any action, it costs a bit of Ether. So our system actually pays out some LUSD and some Ether to more than cover the cost of liquidation. So it's kind of like well incentivized and these liquidations do happen pretty much instantly when somebody is vulnerable to it. So most liquidations we see happening, you know, even if the price of Ether is dropping heavily or quite fast, we see liquidations happen at like 109% or 108%, you know, just as the positions just fallen below the, the minimum collateral ratio. Mm-hmm. That so, happens automatically then, it's sort, of, sort of... Yeah, you can yeah. think of it as automatic. It's kind of outsourced to anybody who wants to actually trigger that function. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. But it's, to the, yeah so, just, so to the lender, basically, or to, the borrower. Who triggers that function? I, I didn't quite catch it. It can actually be anybody, like anybody with a, you know, can sit at their laptop and just call that function. They can go on a website that accesses liquidity, uh-huh. see a vulnerable trove, liquidate it, and make a profit. So it's kind of a, kind of a race between, you know, Uh, Okay, interesting. So if you and I are are through your protocol in in a loan agreement, you know, someone who's watching live now can can actually liquidate that that agreement between the two of us. So there wouldn't be an agreement between two parties in liquidity. It's um it's really just you borrow against your own collateral and the borrowed funds Mm -hmm. are just minted by the system when you borrow. Yeah. So but in terms of liquidation, that's right. Like Anyone, a third party, you know, not liquidity, not you, the borrower, just someone else on the internet can can liquidate you. And actually, originally, like when we launched, we saw that happening, these kind of manual liquidations where people are actually pressing that button on the front end website. But now it's kind of become much more automated and people run bots and do it more professionally. And it's kind of like, you know, it's, uh, yeah, within seconds, liquidations happen from these professional liquidators. And, and they get a share of... What exactly, if they do that, like how do they get rewarded for that? So, so when somebody takes out a loan, 200 LUSD is reserved as a kind of compensation for in case of liquidation. Mm-hmm. So that's paid out for the liquidator. Mm. But also we actually take a small cut of the collateral that is in the, in the loan. We call the loans troves actually. So yeah, so in the trove there's this, there's the ether collateral and we take a small cut, which is 0.5% and that's sent to the liquidator. So that kind of compensates liquidators, even in extreme times of very high network congestion, when the transaction costs are very high, it can always be profitable to liquidate a trove if it's big enough. Yeah. So, so, shall I have a look at the chat and see? Uh, because I think this is something, you know, we just have to get through this a little bit. I, I don't think it's, a, it's on, on the one hand, it's a very difficult system. On the other hand, it's, it's not in the sense that it's, it's very logical, but it, it's pretty tough not to, to crack uh, if you haven't uh, been working in it, I think. So shall I just have a look at the chat and uh, see what people say and, sure. and ask those questions to you then. Okay, let, yeah. let's have a see. So John says, I don't understand the decentralization part. The more I learn of it, so it becomes more of a first come first serve. I guess referring to the, um, to the liquidator, John. And Alan asked, how does the uh, liquidation happen? Because my borrowed funds were used to buy Ether. Are these the right questions to ask? Can you make uh, sense of them? Yeah, sure. So in terms of decentralization, if he's referring to the liquidation, then it's true it is kind of first come, first serve. It is actually a race. But it, it's decentralized in that it's, you know, anybody can do it. So it's kind of permissionless, right? It's like a, an open, it, we're not saying only we can liquidate or only some special party can liquidate. It's actually anybody in the world can liquidate. Hey, and-, and that does make it a race, true, yeah. Mm, there's there is actually another question as well. So uh, Felipe, uh, I think this is a crucial question because this is very much the the sort of where our economists uh, thinking about banks' brain struggles with uh, something like liquidity. Okay. So Felipe asked, how do you determine the borrower's credit worthiness? Yeah, great question. So um, because liquidity is like open and permissionless, 
actually, yeah, the, we have to find a, another way to do it rather than looking at reputation. So it's it's really all automated. So by by kind of uh, requiring that the borrower has this minimum collateral ratio, we know that they're always going to be over collateralized. And as soon as they drop below that, they get liquidated. And so it's like kind of like everybody has to play by the same rules in liquidity. So there's no, there's kind of no way to to default because you know if you if you don't pay back your loan, it's okay. The the, the collateral kind of more than covers your debt. So and it, and if it ever drops in value such such that it's below this minimum threshold, then you you'll be liquidated. So everybody's subject to the same rules, and there's no kind of need to assess creditworthiness actually. Yeah, so that is I, I th- that's also something that I I struggled with, you know, when I started reading about about these types of stable coins. But uh, you know, it makes sense. I think, like for example, if you would do this with a house, you you post a house worth two hundred thousand dollars to the system, for example, you get two hundred thousand dollars, and you get one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. And the moment that the house price drops anywhere close to one hundred and eighty, you you get liquidated before that. So there's never a loss on anyone other than yourself because yeah. of the collateral, right? Right. So, so, and that's also why you don't have to. There's not the traditional banking that you have to care about the creditworthiness of any borrower. You only care about the collateral. Yeah, yeah. and Ether is very simple collateral. It's like you know, it's fungible. It's one single cryptocurrency. Okay, so Elon actually uh, said uh, that I, I, I looked at the wrong question. So uh, the right one. Can I borrow against my Ether to buy more Ether? And then if Ether drops too much, I get instantly liquidated, which would cause Ether to drop more, which would cause someone else to get liquidated. That's a really good question, yeah. So you can definitely leverage up like that. You can kind of deposit Ether, borrow LUSD, sell it for Ether, redeposit, and kind of increase your ETH exposure. So you can actually leverage up. You can do that up to like 11x leverage in our system by kind of going through that leverage cycle a few times. It doesn't affect the price of Ether because our system actually gets the external price of Ether from the market. So we use an external data provider that like feeds in the Ether price to our system. We don't like sort of have some internal measure of Ether price like they would on, say, a centralized exchange where they're actually, you know, the trading is occurring on such an exchange and they have their own kind of Ether price. But, so, if, but if you're very big, doesn't, doesn't it affect the price of Ether? Yeah. If if we got big enough such that like the majority of ether was in our system, yes, then then there'll be this kind of like extra effect. Um, we're not quite that big yet, <laughs> so it's like I think less than one percent of all ether is in liquidity. But you know that that'll be like a, a very kind of yeah. But yeah, but one of the reasons why we, why we chose ether actually because it is such a big has a big liquidity pool and it, it's good for collateral. But aren't there a lot of protocols like you, like stablecoins, that do something similar like this? So, so that maybe in all stablecoins there is a lot of ether uh, locked up like this, or is that not the case? Yeah, there, there are. It's a good question. Like, what what the aggregate impact would be of all these kind of lending protocols? I mean, ether is not only used in lending protocols. It's it's on exchanges. It's uh, it's in different places. I think like the ecosystem as a whole kind of balance because there's there's borrowing, lending, saving, trading. Ether's used like for NFTs and payments and things like that. So it's quite diverse. But yeah, I think that, that there is a risk. Like if it all got too concentrated in one kind of product, that could happen. Yeah. So the the way I looked at it first is because when I, I, I started looking into this, I was definitely thinking about the same type of questions that were just asked uh, in the chat in the sense that I was think, thinking from a financial stability kind of perspective. And what we have seen in in financial markets in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, which you know completely collapsed, is actually yeah. something rather similar to to what you're doing in the sense that there, there there came into force or into you know something new was invented, which was market based banking. And and what market based banking, a big part of that are repo markets. And I think this is fairly similar in a way to what's happening in repo markets in the sense that you can borrow very liquid money. Uh, by posting, you know, excess collateral, some uh, an illiquid asset, and what you did see in repo markets, uh, and what you still, what you also, for example, saw in repo markets during COVID into in 2019, I think, or 2020, what, yeah, 2020, I, I guess, that you saw this very big and sudden collapse in U.S. Treasuries, which was very strange because you know I, I even owned U.S. Treasuries at the time because it, this is 
usually a very safe asset. This is the safest asset you can have on a from a global currency perspective. And then a lot of economists sort of came up with why is this happening? Well, because repo markets have gotten so big that a small drop in uh, U.S. Treasuries caused sort of all of that collateral to no longer be sufficient. And hence, uh, people had to close their positions. And to do that, they had to sell more treasuries. And so that would suppress the treasury price even further. And that would cause even more collateral that needed to be sold. Like You can see how that might form a positive feedback loop. And I wonder if this also might be the case, uh, you know, if a lot of protocols are there like you. Right, if you get, or if you get big enough, yeah. If if a big enough chunk of the the total ether supply is kind of used as collateral in in lending protocols, then yeah, th- I think that risk probably does increase. Just in terms of like our individual system, I would say we we we're quite protected against uh, the need to kind of actually sell off the collateral because we have this part of the system called a stability pool, and that's almost like an insurance pool where people can deposit their LUSD. And when liquidations occur, it's it's that pool that will will buy the collateral and clear the debt. So it's kind of like the, the funds are already there and ready to to buy the collateral. And the reason why people like to deposit there is primarily because, well, partly we we kind of issue uh, LQTY tokens as a kind of uh, incentive to p- deposit there. But we also it's basically like when a liquidation occurs at, at like below one ten percent but above one hundred percent it's actually profitable for whoever receives that collateral because they clear the debt, but they, they, they make more in collateral than they get by clearing the debt. So members of the stability pool can actually make a profit by buying those liquidations. And it, it happens instantly and automatically when liquidations occur. So this is separate from the LQTY tokens that you mentioned, right? Yes, it's a separate piece. Yeah. Can I compare this to anything in, in banking? Because we we try to compare the LQTY to equity. Like, how, yeah. how would I see? Do you think there is an analogy in in normal in nor, normal finance? I think the closest is probably like an insurance pool or something where people kind of provide funds in advance, and they. I mean, it's it's a bit different. It's kind of a mixture of insurance plus like you know buying the collateral in advance. I think. It's hard to think of something that's identical, actually, in, in traditional finance. Because in, in the stability pool, they would expect a profit most of the time if the liquidated loan has like a, a collateral surplus, so it's like still above 100% collateral ratio. But if, if the ETH price has you know, dropped a lot and pulled that loan down below 100%, then it would actually uh, realize a loss for those stability pool depositors who kind of automatically buy that collateral. Okay, I think uh, now I, I have found a, uh, a question of a user that's more into this ecosystem than I am. Fadi asks, what's going to make Liquity attract more users against Compound slash Aave? I, I, I hope I pronounced it correctly, A-A-V. Yes. These are other stable coins, I guess? So these are um, kind of multi-sided lending markets with like a borrower and a lender. So somebody could choose to be a lender on Compound or Aave and they could or they could take the other side and be a borrower. Mm. So it's kind of it's a different proposition because we don't have lenders. It's really you're you're borrowing against your you're kind of like the system is issuing the LUSD in, in, in liquidity. So one advantage we have is this uh, low collateral ratio, low minimum. So the one one hundred and ten percent collateral ratio is kind of unprecedented in DeFi, and there's no interest rate. So you just pay this one time upfront fee and. You can compare the kind of the, the fee to interest rates in other protocols, and if your loan is long enough, that one-time upfront fee will will always be an interest rate. Yeah. So, uh, so your interest rates are lower, and that's how you attract users away from uh, borrowers, at least away from those protocols. Is that that ha- yeah. summary? It's definitely like um, one thing people like. I think it also, I think like we've really focused on being kind of very purist with the decentralization. So we've like made the system completely immutable and unchangeable. I think other protocols often have upgradability or some kind of uh, governance or admin control. And some users see that as a downside. Some, some users see it as a plus because it can be upgraded and improved. But for Liquity, we took the other approach where it's just like set in stone from the start. And that seems to appeal to, to many people. Hey, but what I don't understand about that is, you know, we tried to schedule a stream before. And at some point you were very busy. And uh, okay, also at some points I was very busy. But anyway, it seemed to be that you were working on an upgrade or something. But how is it possible if the system is immutable? Right, so the, the core system is immutable. That's mm-hmm. true. 
Um, it's always possible to build kind of extra layers that plug into it or integrations around it. So we, we've done a lot of research in terms of like new systems and also kind of like complementary systems. But yeah, that core system of Liquity is, is out there set in stone and can't be changed at all. But it, it is possible to build integrations or plugins that kind of attach onto it, yeah. Uh, so, so can you name an example of a plugin? What, yes. what should I think about Right, so um, one example is like a protocol called B Protocol. They they utilize our stability pool, and so in the stability pool, a depositor deposits LUSD, and over time, their LUSD deposit depletes, but it gets kind of replaced with ETH and LQTY. That happens when liquidations occur. So they kind of they buy these liquidations, and what B Protocol do is they automatically convert those kind of liquidation gains back into LUSD. So it's kind of an auto-compounding protocol. So you can deposit in LUSD, and you know if you withdraw after some liquidations, you'll get pure LUSD back. So it's kind of a nice, um, nice addition. Mm. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so that makes it easier for the users, but it doesn't fundamentally alter the structure of of your protocol. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, one thing that I do wonder about this, and and now I, I there, we're also wondering in sort of a pet, pet project of mine. So what I did during my PhD is something called agent-based modeling. Now I've seen that you've also worked on, on something like that, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. But what I learned there is so so what I then did is I built these simulation models of sort of interacting agents, and they have a behavior, and you know I thought about this like what would be a realistic behavior. But what I noticed is that very often when I made such a system, so think about like I made an entire macro economy. So there were like households and firms and banks and a central bank and a government, and they all interacted with each other via set rules. I think that's a bit similar to how you have thought about before, probably when designing this protocol, like how people will act. You thought about their behavior, and that's how you structured the incentives. I, I, I think. You will correct me later on this if I'm wrong. But what I noticed there is that because if a system is complex, meaning that if one party interacts with the other party, and then that party interacts, like even if the the behavior is relatively simple, you can get very surprising outcomes. And so what I noticed there is, uh, or or what my instinct sort of how my instinct around that developed is like immutability is horrible because very often something happened in those simulations and it might have happened only in 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 let's say uh, 3 out of 500 uh, randomly generated simulations uh, that i never expected beforehand and so you know that's what we would call a bug right and then i had to update the system to accommodate that uh, but if you don't have that feature like you know like how how, how do you view that yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I think like the more interactions you have between agents, generally the more unintended consequences you're going to see for sure. I suppose with Liquity, there's not really that kind of high level of interactivity between the agents. You know, it's like people are interacting directly with the protocol, mm-hmm. and you know, a borrower is borrowing directly from the protocol using their own collateral, and they're not interacting with other borrowers per se. They can obviously sell their LUSD, but that's quite a simple interaction. It's like you're buying or selling it. Yeah, but yeah. but I guess people who put money in the liquidity pool, who stake LQTY, or who borrow, they do interact in in some way, right? Yeah, you can. I mean, they're taking a share of the pool for sure, and a share of whatever kind of rewards go to that pool. But um, you know, they're they're part of an aggregate. But again, they're, they're kind of not they're not interacting directly with other other pool members. I would say, but like, it's a great point about immutability. I think like it is a it's a trade off and it's a design decision. You know, you. You lose something and you gain something from it, and yeah, you know, we 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 were pretty paranoid about like just testing as many worst case scenarios as possible and doing as much modeling as we could do, kind of for ourselves and hiring external agencies to do that, and spending a ton of time on security and kind of crypto economic analysis and really trying to get everything right. So yeah, it is a trade off, you know. But you can also make the case for upgradability, like upgradability itself with blockchain protocols actually introduces bugs and mm-hmm. introduces more surface area for things to go wrong. And we've seen things go wrong when protocols have done an upgrade or a, you know, a kind of new governance proposal and things have broken like two days after the change. So yeah, it's, that's also a risk as well. Yeah, okay. So, so you're making uh, sort of the argument like keep it simple a little bit. 
And then yeah. you also have less of this, uh, the chance that, that something happens that's unexpected, like I, as I mentioned. Uh, I do agree with that. If I look back at my modeling adventures, the simpler models almost never really, ha- or, uh, you know, didn't have that problem as much for sure. That's, that's definitely true. And you also use agent based modeling, right? When designing this protocol. Uh, so basically, maybe to simulate uh, sort of some scenarios. Is, is that how, how you used it? Yeah, so we, we did some basic modeling ourselves, um, but we also hired an external firm who were kind of experts in the area to to really dig into it. And they kind of the goal for that was uh, to stress test the system. And we hired this mm-hmm. company called Gauntlet, who do a lot of modeling for blockchain firms. And basically, we wanted to see like you know, how how does the system stand up under very high um, ETH volatility and under very high network transaction costs. And so they, yeah, they created a bunch of different agents with these kind of like range of preferences for kind of risk tolerance and um, also like I think response time. So like some agents would react quickly to the ETH price and some would ever touch their position and kind of forget about it. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they did this um, big modeling kind of run with like these parameter sweeps over all these different configurations and found that well, they were kind of looking to see at what minimum collateral ratio do things start to go a bit wrong and what minimum collateral ratio would be safe. And they found that the, the parameters we chose in the end, this 110% minimum collateral ratio, is uh, yeah is, is very safe with a low risk of insolvency, very low risk. Mm-hmm. And I, they also found that the system would only enter something called recovery mode very rarely. And this is a mode of the system where it tries to kind of avoid becoming insolvent when it's, when it's getting a bit close to that level. And and how does the system get it insolvent? I know it's a, an edge case, but does it does it happen when the the price of Ethereum ha- uh, drops so fast, such that the liquidations don't come in fast enough, such that uh, some loans have to be liquidated when Ether price is already below collateral value? Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's really kind of how we define insolvency with liquidity. It's if the total collateral ratio, so that all the backing of Ether against the total outstanding debt. If that ever falls below 100%, we could consider the system insolvent. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, that's obviously a situation the system does its best to avoid. And it, as you said, it, it comes down to that comparison between how fast the Ether price drops and how fast we can liquidate to clear out the, the unhealthy loans. So you know, liquidations are very fast in liquidity. And one thing we did was we looked at kind of the, the biggest price drop that can happen between two updates of the data feed for the Ether price. And historically, it's it's never gone above 10%. It's, it's mostly like much lower than that. And so we realized that actually uh, that's the margin you need for the um, collateral surplus in the minimum. So if the, the maximum price drop between two updates is 10%, we need a minimum collateral ratio of 110%. And actually since like we kind of did that analysis, the, the, the maximum price deviation has actually decreased because the, the the data feed provider has got better with their, their kind of yeah the way they provide data basically so so basically yeah liquidations have to happen very quickly and clear out the bad debt yeah but so yeah, first of all I think it's like this is when I read about your protocol first I, I love to see that actually uh, agent based modeling uh, has some uses uh, like that because in economics it, it never really got got on because it, like, like from a scientific perspective it's it's not it's not that interesting if to build a very complex model to show something very simple then sort of it, you know it ended up uh, such that people preferred building a very simple model just to show some some simple mechanism basically you know that right then you can write a shorter paper but i always had in the back of my mind like it would be cool to sort of stress test systems before they come online Using yeah. an agent-based model, and then you can learn sort of you know where it might break. Like it might break if human uh, if humans enter as well, but at least you maybe have sort of uh, sniffed out two or three scenarios beforehand. So that, that, that's how you used it, right? Absolutely, yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah, and there's always factors you can't control and irrational behavior you won't capture, but it's it is really good for catching catching some things, yeah. Hey, and um, like if we go into a little bit of more of the philosophical, you know, part of 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 this uh, of this protocol and crypto in general, I've noticed, and I've also seen like people post that or or allude to that in some of the comments that in a post that I made, you know, announcing a stocking, 
And that is, isn't there a little bit of a uh, sort of uh, intellectual uh, friction between sort of the core, or maybe I shouldn't say core, but uh, one big crypto ideology, which is fixed money supply. And, you know, Ether has that, some form of that, I think, right? But what you do is sort of you, you, you allow that to multiply by a lot. So you're basically sort of creating money within crypto. How do you view that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, so I think like you could sort of see it in aggregate as, I think because we're locking Ether as collateral, it's like, and the fact that the LUSD created is always backed one-to-one by Ether. I mean, I suppose, yeah, you could consider that Ether almost as coming out of the money supply in a way, mm-hmm. if you're then issuing LUSD against it. So there is some balance there. Mm-hmm. We're not like just kind of printing money with no backing. So that would be like, you know, an inflationary system. But actually, Ether itself is is somewhat inflationary. It's not fully, you know, fully hard cap supply. Yeah. But you are creating more purchasing power within the crypto space, right? Because people can actually yeah. use those. They ha- hold the Ether, and then they can use uh, sort of the 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 new money that I will say that you have printed right. to buy other cryptos, driving up their price. Yes. That's true. Yes, which which is inflationary. Uh, if we use sort of the price inflationary sort of way of talking about inflation, yeah, I, th- I take that point. Do you, do you get discussions around this topic a lot, or is it something that that, that basically lives besides each other? Because I've I've mainly talked to like I've talked to one stablecoin project before. And also, it was interesting because it was more of a sort of a recognition, like yeah, okay, but there's not really uh, sort of this friction. Like it sounds like there are two types of crypto uh, people. Maybe the the people who who are super hard about the fixed money supply are just more vocal. Yeah, I think um, like particularly the Bitcoin community. This is like a really big kind of passion of theirs, or kind of core value. When it has this hard cap supply, and Ether is slightly inflationary. And I think one criticism the Bitcoin people have of Ether is that it's like kind of more subject to a social consensus among the the kind of people who develop and promote Ethereum, you know, it's like they may change the the inflation rate in future, right? Whereas Bitcoin supposedly wouldn't, and it's supposed to be more of a guarantee there. But I think everything is a social consensus in some way. Like even even the kind of Bitcoin system, it's all it's still a social consensus that everybody runs the same software that has this hard cap supply. And if if enough people decide to change or think it should be inflationary, it, it would then change. So it's just that they pr- there are more people who do prefer a hard cap supply in Bitcoin, so it probably is less likely to change. I think everything is social consensus. And shall, shall we see if uh, if the chat has anything to say about this? Uh, yeah. Because there might be some uh, you know uh, controversy surrounding this. I, I would imagine. Let, let me have a look. I also know that in my uh, my audience there are also a lot of people who are not necessarily on board with this um, part of crypto, and who sort of see a flexible money supply as being a good thing. Um, yep. Fadi says outstanding market supply of stable coins would rank them in the top 20 financial institutions in the US I guess he's probably then referring to all stable coins okay I'm not sure yeah. is, is that true like are you how big are you on the financial systems or sort of uh, player scale I think that's true if you include um, like the kind of bank coins that are backed by deposits in a bank like Tether which is very big, and that, that dwarfs even the biggest kind of crypto collateralized backed stablecoin. So, yeah, it depends how you define stablecoin. Like in terms of crypto collateral stablecoins, it's the top ones. It's not more than a few billion, I think, of money supply, US yeah. dollars. And how? Because you have been so. Look, if I look at stablecoins, the worry that I always had is like this is creating a lot of extra liquidity in the in the crypto system, and that's mainly being used to buy other crypto coins. That's how I, how I see it. And please correct me if, if you think, no, 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 this is actually feeding into the, the real economy, as, as I would say it. Yes. And so how I view that is sort of, uh, even though I think it's a bit different, especially what you're doing from leverage in the traditional sense, because people don't borrow, like you mentioned, from someone else necessarily. They just borrow against their, their own collateral. I do think a lot of liquidity can, or it, it comes across as, as if there's a big bear market to the, the price of, of crypto, something like Ether, it's going down a lot, a lot of the liquidity will evaporate. So your mm-hmm. system basically will shrink. Oh, Now, yeah. there has been a bit of a bear market. Is is that yeah. what happened? So did LAUSD sort of shrink by by quite a bit? Yeah, that's true. And it, it, is, it is, yeah. 
and we see that on kind of days where ether crashes a lot yeah it's it's it shrinks there's liquidations occur and people repay their loans to stay to avoid liquidation so that that is how it works yeah yeah, so I think that's that's very interesting because that, that was a rather eye-opening for me because I used to compare it to th- sort of this market-based banking where then the banks can go bust and that will really sort of kick in sort of a downward cycle because that, then, you know, your credit providers are, are bust. That's not the case with your system, right? Like the system cannot really go bust. And so, but it does, I think, have sort of a, an amplifying effect because it, you know, if liquidity disappears in a system that's under stress, then the system will be more under stress. But if that system for one reason or another stabilizes, then your liquidity can also come back re- relatively quickly, right? Yeah, it can, yeah. yeah. I think the idea with liquidity is really to try and, it should be kind of dynamic. It should respond to the market. It should contract and expand as needed. I guess you, you can get some kind of cascade effects when all these crypto systems, as you said, like if crypto is used just in other systems, if you just issue LUSD just to use it in another system or, you know, the, the more interconnected they are, the more you can get some kind of cascade effects. I think that's true. And it would be nice to see more real world usage. And that is something we kind of like, we hope to see like people actually taking loans for, you know, real world purposes, like, uh, you know, buying a house or a car or maybe like paying for their studies or something like that. Um, but I think, yeah, crypto is quite, it is a bit insular, the whole ecosystem. I think that's fair. But it's true, right? That people take a loan to buy other cryptocurrencies. Or, or, or how, do you know youth get use cases where they don't do that? They can do. That, that's one, one use case. They might, for example, if they take an LUSD loan, they could actually, they could use that LUSD, they could actually become a, an LP, so a liquid liquidity provider on, on an exchange. So they could deposit it to an exchange and it would actually, they would just like capture some trading fees on an exchange. So they're not actually using it to buy crypto, they're using mm-hmm. it to just like buy liquidity and then earn fees on that. And there's other places they can kind of earn interest on it as well. Right, yeah. yeah. But it still stays then within the crypto ecosystem and it still serves maybe as a function to, to, to increase other cryptocurrency prices. Potentially, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so this is just something. Yeah, it's it's a bit. That's a bit where I struggle with stable coins in the sense that. So I think what you're doing is, it, from a technical perspective, is amazing because it's it's very innovative. Like to have a decentralized bank, so to say, or or, or bank ish kind of thing is 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 very interesting. I think I, but I would really love to see something like this be implemented to support the real economy rather than more speculation in crypto or speculation in the financial sector in general. I, I don't have anything against crypto uh, that I don't have against finance in general in the sense that I, I just think that there's, there are too many sort of asset booms and busts and bubbles and too, too many people sort of earning their money with trading stuff rather than creating stuff, so to say. And, and I would really, do you think it's possible to sort of apply the lessons that we learned here to, to, I don't know, you know, this is that the other project, that this was this reserve project, they were thinking about that at, at least. It's like, hey, how can we bring money to societies where there isn't money? So maybe something like your, the lessons that you have learned here can be used to, to, for a money system that can sort of emerge in a country where there is not enough of a money system. And you can maybe post collateral, not ether, but a house, right, or something that people actually have there. But that's probably very difficult because ether is, is super easy to post as collateral in a blockchain system, right? Yeah, that's um, it's hard to get like real world assets sort of into the blockchain system. It's kind of a closed system in a way because it has to. It's hard for it to know about um, external things that aren't like part of the the Ethereum network. Um, yeah, it would be nice. And I think like that originally that was the vision is to kind of enable you know, the man on the street to borrow against their assets and actually use that for something important in their life, right? Covering expenses or, you know, buying an important purchase. And people can borrow LUSD and then sell it for fiat and do that. But yeah, I do agree that there's, there is a big financial focus at the moment in crypto. And also but the man what? on the street typically doesn't have ether. It's true. It's right. true, but for now, yeah, yeah. But it has, you know, it's... it's Improving, many more people are becoming aware of it and using these these products. And it, it's also um, like in terms of the the kind of financial sector aspect of it, and the, the 
the comparison to traditional finance, I would say the one big difference that crypto has is that it's it's actually all transparent. So you can't quite have a crash like the GFC because the GFC, uh, all these kind of like bad assets were were opaque, right? Like people didn't see until it was too late that it was like this bunch of bad mortgages wrapped up and sold as as high quality securities. Mm. And but I wonder so, if, if that's true because I think those bad mortgages only became bad mortgages when uh, the price of houses dropped. Like before that, they were fine mortgages. Okay, yeah. I mean, had you actually kind of like, it's, I guess it's like the big short, right? Had you gone to those areas and sort of like taken the pulse of the area, you would have sort of thought, well, this isn't really a, like a AAA security. This is like a risky thing that's been resold and resold and kind of rebranded. And yeah, 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 that's true. Okay, yeah. So, but but your asset, like, if we compare it to the big short where they have the houses, right? Your your asset is the, the asset backing all of this is, you know, the the big crypto coins like Ether and and Bitcoin. And they're sort of the barometer that I typically use to see if, if we're in a bubble or not is uh, how many bots are spamming my comments for people to buy crypto and how many of my, my neighbors who know nothing about finance are talking about crypto. Yeah. But I, th- I still think you could have that though. Th- does that make sense? What I'm trying to say is like, because the, 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 the foundation that you're building on is, is really based on pure, pure trust. Like I know that. People say money is based on trust. There, I usually say, okay, but what trust in what? Right, trust of what type? And and fiat money, when the government issued, I think is based on the trust that you can buy something useful from the government with that. That's why fiat currencies typically collapse when the government collapses. Right in Zimbabwe, you know, you cannot get much useful stuff from the government anyway. But here, for example, in Belgium, you know, I can pay my taxes in euros. That's what. That's something that backs that. Whereas, like, sort of the the money that you're building on, I would say is more of a pure trust currency because it's only about if people think that it will hold its value or increase in value in the future. Um, yeah. That, do you see yeah. what I'm I'm trying to get at? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I think it has to one way or another. The cryptocurrencies, the kind of native ones, like the core ones, like Ether, they have to bootstrap trust. You know, it doesn't come from it's not there at the start, right? It has to be built over time. Um, but I do think the longer it survives, it's kind of a Lindy thing, right? This concept of like, the longer something survives, the more likely it will survive. I think there's something to that. Mm-hmm. So okay, yeah. You, you can see that already a little bit with uh, something like Bitcoin, perhaps, right? It just has so much name recognition that even if it falls for a long time, it, it, it hasn't yet completely crashed, whereas some altcoins have maybe yeah. gone to zero. Yes, definitely. And every time it sort of crashes and bounces back, or even ends up higher than it, it's crashed, you know that that's, uh, that actually builds confidence because people can look back and say, you know, well, it's, how many times has it crashed and come out stronger or, or survived at least? So, I think like the transparency on the blockchain is important as well because you can you can actually see every transaction; it's all public, and you can like with liquidity, you can immediately see when something is under collateralized and, and deal with that bad debt. I think that's one really cool aspect of the blockchain is that just everything is visible to everybody and. And unhealthy positions are kind of exposed early on. But is it also like for liquidity? Yes, I, I would agree because that's so purely based on ether as collateral, which for which the price is known, right? But I wonder if it's like one thing that I've always wanted is yeah, yeah, the blockchain is is open and for everybody to see, but you don't necessarily know uh, sort of who holds that and what they have done yes. to get that money. But this is maybe something that more applies to something like Bitcoin, for example, right? You still don't know if, if someone got their Bitcoin, you know, through selling drugs or, you know, by trading successfully in crypto markets in general. Yeah, it's, it's true. It's kind of pseudonymous. Like if you look at any given address, you can't, there's no kind of ID attached to an address, right? So, yeah, but I think like the, um, in terms of tracking the bad stuff, like, you know, as you said, like drugs or, you know, Kind of terrorism financing of those those activities, like it's actually it's quite quite viable to actually track all the transactions online and, and deduce what came from where. And there are firms that do that, like Chainalysis, for example, work with governments, and they're very good at tracking kind of the flows of funds and tracing it back to certain places. And I think um, that actually makes it not a good tool for um, these illicit uses because it is so traceable. I and mean, you have to actually do the work to trace it, but it's it's all visible and, and transparent. 
Hey, Rick, if I can, if I can maybe sort of try to bring our conversation together and then see if there are some more questions uh, in the chat. I hope yeah. that, you know, through watching this conversation, uh, people got a better idea of what a protocol like Liquity is about and that it is truly decentralized money in the sense that it is really, there's not a, an intermediate entity, it's, it's a protocol and that the main use case has been for people to lock up their ether and basically monetize that or borrow in other words to say that I, I, that's how I like to say it but uh, in other words to say that is like borrow LUSD with uh, ether as collateral and then this create, creates purchasing power and in my opinion that's money creation because that, that can be, then be people can then hold ether and buy something else as well. So the problem that I had with it, and I, I sensed some agreement from your side, uh, is that it's still, as of now, largely within the crypto space. Whereas, like how I posed my title of, of this video, and also what I saw in a lot of comments beforehand, is like there's still sort of this drive to bring decentralized money into the real economy, so to say. And we're just not, not there yet. But maybe people can learn a lot from how you have organized your protocol. Would that be a fair summary? Yeah, I think it's a fair summary. And if anybody does want to take a loan and use it in the real world, then they can borrow LSD and, and trade it immediately on an exchange like Gemini for, for dollars and then you know, buy their actual real purchase. So it's, it is doable, but uh, yeah, it'd be great to see more of it. Yeah, okay. It, it, that's, a good, that's a good optimistic uh, note to end with. It is possible, right? Like I m might have Ether. I want to invest in Ether. But I also want to start my own YouTube company uh, for which I need funding. I can lock that up, that Ether, borrow LUSD, sell it for fiat and buy some better uh, microphone. Exactly. And be more yes. productive. <laughs> so it is possible to link it with the real economy, although we're a little bit in doubt about how much that actually happens. Might, we might need to incentivize people, you know, more people to, to link up with the real economy. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Rick, thank you so much. Uh, let's see what, what people uh, have to say in the chat. Uh, but there's also, like, this is interesting maybe for you as well, Rick, there's, there's a vivid sort of discussion in the chat that is, uh, that is around the subjects that we discuss, but it's also a little bit contained in the sense that uh, people are just arguing amongst each other. For example, uh, Charlie Silva says, we should not pretend that a financial crisis cannot happen with this. I don't. I don't think you 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 pretended that. But uh, Fadi says Bitcoin is a brand that has value. Bitcoin doesn't support programs. Can't be coded on. That's that's why so many of of you use Ether, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Yes. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. I think are there any stablecoins back to gold? Wouldn't this be safer? Alternative, considering the increase in gold price at the start of the Ukraine invasion, this could prevent insolvency, maybe. Could could we build a stablecoin backed by gold? You think, Rick, or is is it will it then be a problem that gold is not on the blockchain? That's the tricky part. Um, if you have a volatile asset, then yeah, how do you know when to liquidate? I think that's the tricky part. But I mean, you could you could feed the gold price onto the blockchain. That's doable. It depends how you want to do it. Yeah, we, I think there are some projects that have tried to do that. You could take the sort of bank coin approach where you have it actually deposited in a bank, or you could have yeah something where you like a, a gold security or something where you then feed the price onto the blockchain, maybe. Um, kind of tricky because you, you've got to cross the, you've got to manage the collateral off chain as well as deal with things on chain. Yeah. Hey, uh, there's definitely a question here. Will, and, and that I think relates to the discussion that we had at the end of our, our chat. Will a country ever be based on a decentralized currency? Interesting. It'll be really cool to see it. I don't know if, I honestly don't know if, you'd see a country based on it. I think when you start to get into that level of like states and state currency, there's kind of geopolitical considerations as well that come into play and it's not just financial. So I don't know. And there's big geopolitical players that kind of put pressure on smaller states when they start thinking about these things. But it would be super interesting to see for sure. Yeah, what, what I find interesting there is that almost all of the stable coins link still to US dollar, right? So even though a lot of sort of people with a political leanings towards, you know, not wanting to be attached to any government money, 
I, I think you know your stablecoin is also linked to the U.S. dollar still, right? Like Tether is 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 a is a very famous example. But do you know any examples of of stablecoins that that are truly uh, not coupled to the, to the fiat system? Don't really build on top of the fiat system? Yeah, there is a, a stablecoin, well, a project called Rai. I'm not sure. I think their intent was to create some kind of like something that is not coupled to any any fiat. Yeah, fiat coin, but I think the trade-off there was the actual stability of the asset because obviously it fluctuates in relation to any given coin or basket of, of fiat coins. Um, but yeah, that's another interesting approach. They they took a fully decentralized approach, or actually not fully, but quite decentralized approach, similar to us. And how so, do you spell that? Rai, yeah. like R Y E or R A I. R A I. Okay, I'll post it in the chat for people. Who maybe want to look that up. Later, I also had a question uh, earlier about: uh, Is this environmentally friendly? I would guess that depends on what Ether, Ethereum is doing, but I'm not sure if that's true. Yeah, that's true. It basically depends on the kind of um, underlying yeah, energy efficiency of the um, blockchain. And Ethereum is currently using proof of work, but so it's, which is not environmentally friendly. It's these warehouses of miners, <laughs> but it's very quickly, very soon this year, going to move to proof of stake, which is much, much more environmentally friendly where there's no mining involved no kind of warehouses of computers churning numbers it's just the consensus mechanism is is formed by stakers so yeah it will improve a lot this year okay i also have a question here from earlier from my post is what will be done to limit the ability of governments to interfere with your money so we you know we've, we've built this back-end system on the blockchain and we don't like operate the system. It's kind of this software that we've now deployed and it lives on Ethereum. So I think it's really up to individual governments as to how they treat that. Like we don't even actually operate a front end to our system. So we don't run a website that connects to the liquidity back end and allows people to interact with liquidity and borrow LUSD. Other people run those front ends and they're based in different places and it's up to them to comply with you know whatever regulations they're, they're subject to based on where they, they live. So I think different governments have different opinions of these things. Seems like in the West, you know, like the UK, US seem to be hopefully going in a fairly kind of uh, liberal direction with um, kind of favoring innovation, maybe hopefully going that way. Maybe Europe is a bit more um, yeah, pro-regulation on that front. We'll see what happens. I think um, I expect some countries will will kind of ban front ends to these, these decentralized finance systems because it's they, they maybe see it as a... A destabilizing factor or something that they just don't want in the, in the country. So, yeah, like China, for example, I think it's very hard to access DeFi there now. Yeah, I mean, I, one thing that I, I've noticed is that in more and more, especially smaller emerging economies, crypto is having an influence in the sense that it's a way to get past capital controls. So even though you can't get your money out of the country easily via the normal banking system, which can be controlled more easily, you know, they do it via crypto, but then again, uh, you can block access to crypto as well. Yeah, you can always block these kind of on-ramps to and from the fiat system. So yeah, that's where governments would exert their control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I guess that, that comes back to what we discussed, right? There is a lot of interesting innovation going on in space, but it is still built on top of the fiat system. And and I don't think anyone has come up with a way to, to get sort of detached from that. I'm not saying that you should want that necessarily, but that's, I think, a discussion for uh, for another video, uh, probably. But maybe you have a, a stronger opinion on that than I do. Sure, I, I would say it's like the crypto ecosystem is, is definitely parallel, but it has these kind of ties into the fiat system. So for like pegging to, yeah, pegging strong currencies. Ties, right. Sorry, what's that? Strong ties. Like your, yes. your stablecoin is completely pegged to USD. That's a pretty strong tie, right? It's not a detail. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And it's pegged to USD because USD is, you know, it's the kind of global reserve currency, right? So it's like the, the biggest, the largest liquidity. Um, it's the one people want to denominate things in. Yeah, um, no, true. Like uh, government currencies also have that that same issue, right? Like uh, a, a, like big governments like Turkey or something like that. They also just have that reality that uh, the US dollar is the global reserve. So you have to connect to that if you want to do international transactions. Yeah. That's right, yeah. But I do think you can you don't need a crypto system completely detached from the fiat world to, to have some benefits of it. So um, as I said, it's like fully transparent. It's, it can be automatic. You can at least remove the kind of counterparty risk or the risk of a middleman messing with things. 
And things can be instant. You know, you can send crypto around the world in 30 seconds. You could send a billion dollars of LUSD in 30 seconds for a fee of a few dollars. And the fee wouldn't change depending on the amount. So there are kind of just like straight advantages, whether or not it's, you know, kind of independent of how well it's coupled to fiat. Right. Okay. So, so that is the case because I actually ran into that issue, right? Like I used to work in South Africa and then they have rents. I wanted to transfer money because I had to leave the country and I had a car there, for example. I wanted to transfer it back to Europe. That's not easy. That's that's a bit of a pain to to go through. You have to. Uh, so I had to call with a bank to transfer some like that. Uh, it's it's not not easy. At some point, it was actually getting so annoying and so difficult that I considered looking into a cryptocurrency to to do that. But then I I, I thankfully got through to the bank uh, and they they made the transaction happen. But uh, that that I think there are many many. Innovations going on also in the normal financial space, making international transactions easier. Uh, but you know, for many people, it's still a very costly and tricky, difficult thing to do. Yeah, I think that's true. Okay, excellent. Let's see if there's one last question, and then then I think uh, we can conclude. Uh, I have one question here from uh, Evars, which is: I don't fully understand the question myself, but you, you hopefully will. Uh, is any bridges for LQTY token on other chain? So could it be used as collateral? Okay, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, so a bridge is basically something that connects different blockchains or connects like different layers of a blockchain. It is bridged to uh, some other layers. So it's there's a bridge to, I know there's a bridge to Optimism. I think, is there one for Arbitrum as well now? I'm not sure. And yeah, you can, you can use it elsewhere. And I think most places... Um, Oftentimes you don't need a specialized bridge. It's just something, you know, if they allow transfer of this kind of ERC-20 standard token, you can either set the bridge up or um, just use their, their kind of generic bridge to take it over to different chains. So that's very, very doable. Okay, one final question from uh, Tony. Instability makes it an investment. I think referring to normal cryptocurrencies. Um, stability will make it a currency. I think that that is referring to what stablecoins do. What will make this transition? I'm not not entirely sure about how uh, what Tony means with what will make this transition, but maybe he refers to you linking, like what you're doing is you, or maybe you could say you're making this transition because what you are doing is you take something which is volatile, ether, and which is a great is more often considered an investment, I think, and you are issuing something which I think is closer to a currency because it's. By design, stable. It's it's not necessarily a great investment, uh, or in, in the sense that you don't expect the price to to skyrocket. So I guess like what is making this transition? Liquidity is making this transition. Could you say that? Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, you're kind of converting a, a risky asset to a stable one, but you're keeping your exposure to the the, the investment asset. Right. Excellent. With that, uh, I hope that uh, that people have. Um, have a good idea of what liquidity is about, what's happening a little bit in the uh, crypto DeFi space and how it links up to monetary economics. That, that uh, is a big part of, of this channel. So Rick, thank you so much for, for talking to us, sharing your knowledge with us, answering these questions. And uh, yeah, I, I wish you all the best uh, with uh, the liquidity project. And I, I really hope that at some point you will be able to link it more to, to the real economy, uh, the lessons you learned here. Yeah, for sure. I hope so too. And that's, that's the plan. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was uh, really a great chat and some great questions. Really fun. Right. Thanks.